he's actually one of the real early, I guess, progenitors of the data community DC. Uh, he's one of the people he saw what was going on in New York and he said, you know what, DC can use that. And he helped build an amazing community in DC, which we are very proud to partner with to do this conference. They are, you know, a bunch of really good people. And we would like to give um, a big warm welcome to Mark Weissman as he comes up, one of the leaders of the DC community, to give us his next talk. Please welcome Mark. Stand up, show us your shirt. Yeah, oh. Yeah, hey. Ah, there we go. Yep, we're twinning. Ah. And we even both have the same hoodie on too. My hoodie's on the floor over there. All right, have a good talk. <laughs> Thanks. So my talk today is about uh, a bunch of collaborative work that uh, I've been a part of over the last year. And I'm really, really excited to talk about this. This is, this is a joint effort, joint work between an academic government and industry collaboration. So several folks are involved in this. Uh, first, of course, is the US Forest Service, um, which is part of the USDA Department of Agriculture. The second kind of, and they're all related, but the second part of is uh, Florida A&M University uh, and, Ascent, and the CSER, which is the Center for Spatial Ecology and Restoration, and of course, Microsoft. So they're my customer. Uh, the US Forest Service is my customer. Uh, as you know, I work for Microsoft. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, this is basically a joint effort between FAMU, for AMU, that created the center, which is a joint effort between them, academic and, uh, and government. Um, and when I was going to give the talk, I, I told Jared, I said, I can talk about this topic about using lighter images for forest management, but I need to ask permission because, uh, you know, the, the, the work really is, is, I am part involved in this, but the work is really not my work, is really the work of uh, the CSER folks, whom I'll acknowledge in a second. And they gave me permission to talk about this. So I'm really excited. Thank you again. Uh, and again, I'm really excited. So a big shout out to CSER at FAMU. So the Center for Spatial Ecolo and Ecological Research, to Jason Drake, to Paul Medley, to Joe St. Peter. He's probably online listening to the, the conference. So hey, Joe, uh, and Jordan Vernon. So uh, I've been working with this team for the last year and uh, they're doing some really, really cool work. Um, a lot of it in R. This is, this is essentially what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna talk about, just give you a quick intro to LIDAR. So I didn't know much about LIDAR before, before working with these folks. I learned a little bit more in preparation for this talk. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you, ultimately I'm just gonna show you what they're doing and really, really cool stuff, uh, how they're using these LIDAR images for, for really um, interesting analysis and for man forest management, conservation, preservation, and all these sorts of other things. Uh, I'm gonna talk, briefly about the LIDAR package, which is what uh, what they're using to process these LIDAR images. And then I'm also gonna to touch on a little bit on how we took a manual workflow that they had, uh, moved it to the cloud and accelerated that as well. So, uh, oh, wait. Oh, and I'm gonna show you some cool, so I'm gonna show you some cool pictures as well. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about me, um, for those that know me, you know that I've been, as Jared said, I've been part of the, the R community and the data science community here in the DC area for a long time. Uh, started Data Community DC, ran the meetups, um, not as involved as today. I still love being a part of the conference and I wish, like I said, to be uh, in person because I really, really love this community. Uh, I work for Microsoft, I'm part of the Microsoft Federal team. I work with federal customers, uh, helping them migrate their work into the cloud. My specialty is in data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, R and Python, of course, all the open source, but really, you know, helping our customers move, use our platform to do their work. You know that I'm an R fanatic, right? Otherwise I would probably wouldn't be here. So um, the what I'm gonna talk about today again, it, the work itself is Caesar's work. Uh, opinions are mine, mine alone, not necessarily representative of anyone uh, that I'm affiliated with. The other thing I wanted to say is for those that actually don't know, another fun fact is I actually didn't, when I started running the meetup group 10 years ago, I didn't know R. And today, quite earlier today, actually, I saw a, a tweet in the, I saw a thread in Twitter about people talking about why they had to learn R or what was the first reason. So for me, it was ggplot, you know, just really, um, that was like the first thing I actually learned. But really the motivation was when I started running the meetup, I was really interested in R in the community but watching other people do really cool work with R like really motivated me to learn it as well. So that was 10 years ago. Of course, a lot has happened uh, in between. Okay, so what is LIDAR? LIDAR is similar to sonar and radar. We all know these terms, right? Uh, basically, it's a sense that there's a signal that gets emitted, gets 
received and it gets processed. So, you know, we know sonar, uh, right? You know, the like the bleeps and the clips, Spaceballs reference here, uh, <laughs> or, or Hunt for October, but like, you know, uses sound waves. Um, and then radar, of course, uses radio waves, right? It emits the wave, it receives it back, and it does the processing. You kind of get a sense to what's out there. Well, guess what LiDAR uses? Anyone care to guess? Actually, I'm not watching the chat, but let me see. Uh, stage. Anyone care to guess what LiDAR uses? Oh, sorry. Drum roll. Laser. <laughs> yes, I'm being a total goofball, I know. Uh, <laughs> no, but right. So LiDAR uses, LiDAR uses, um, yeah, so it's light, light, basically laser, which is a form of light, right? So LiDAR, it's LiDAR means light detection and ranging. So basically what LiDAR has many applications, there, there's a lot of it out there, but in the context of what I'm gonna talk about today, essentially is about collecting uh, aerial LiDAR images uh, from LiDAR units that are flown on planes. So these are planes or drones that fly over areas. So there's the ray of light is sweeping left and right, right, and it's, but, you know, it's bouncing the light off and collecting data and, and so on and so forth, so forth. So that, that's what LiDAR is. And that is the source of the data that, that, is, that I'm gonna show you today. So the LiDAR uses electromagnetic spectrum. It uses the green light uh, or the near infrared. And the reason why is because those are the ones that seem to reflect the best from vegetation. And what you usually see out in the field, right, uh, at least LiDAR. Now, LiDAR is also used, for example, in self-driving cars and a lot of, a lot of new technology, right? And, um, but, and it's the same principle. It's just that it's mounted on a different thing. It could be mounted on your car. I actually think that a lot of uh, the cars that have a lot of the, uh, the safety things or the self-braking, I don't know what technology they use, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of self-driving cars use LiDAR. Uh, probably some of the commercial cars, like the Subarus that have the two lenses, it's probably using LiDAR. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but... Anyway, um, but it's, the point is that you can uh, it, you can either emit LiDAR from the ground, emit it from satellites, uh, or from planes, which is probably the most the most common uh, thing. So, what makes up the LiDAR uh, LiDAR device or the LiDAR system? Uh, it's the LiDAR unit itself, which is attached to the bottom of an aircraft or a drone, right? And it's it's as the the plane is flying, it's it's scanning, it's emitting a light, uh, array of light that's going left to right. There's a GPS, right, which pinpoints the position. It helps uh, also understand not just the X, Y, but also the elevation uh, using GPS locations. And then third, it also uses the uh, inertial measurement unit. Um, because what happens is, you know, as the plane flies, it moves. Uh, also the light, because it's a ray that's going back and forth, left to right, there is an angle. So you need to know the angle of the plane. You need to know the angle of the, of the light beam. So there's a lot of, not just the data that gets collected back, um, but there's also a lot of metadata that gets processed to create all of these images. And what happens, right, when the, when the laser beam is going left to right, it's hitting on objects. Uh, but in the case of vegetation and probably other objects as well, it penetrates. So you actually get many responses at the same point. So when I talk about the images in a little bit, uh, I'm going to talk about the response uh, or multiple readings. And what you get looks something like this. So when you get all that data and it's post-processed, so there's also a computer and software that takes all the stuff and creates these images, what you get out of the LiDAR system is what's called a point cloud. So it's essentially a set of 3D images uh, that is multi, it's basically essentially a multi-dimensional array where there's many different dimensions for, of course, the, the response, the XY location, the measurements, like all of these things get packaged into this file type called point cloud which is of the type, uh, the, the data file itself is of, of, uh, of type LAS. So that's, that's the, I don't know what it actually LAS stands for. I don't think it stands for anything, but um, it's a LAS file. So it's a point cloud and it's a LAS file. It's a standard. Uh, it's uh, done by the American Society of uh, Programmetry and Remote Sensing. There's a GitHub link over here. This is just a part of the specification. This was updated uh, fairly recently. Okay. So that's really what LADAR is. And those are the images that, that uh, the folks at Caesar uh, and other agencies are working with, right? LiDAR is like actually, it is readily available. Um, so from what I understand is there is actually a lot of LiDAR data out there and a lot and governments, state, local governments um, spend a lot of money collecting this data um, for other purposes. 
So, and just to give you an idea, right, and, and these statistics were provided to me. So in, in 2019 and 2020, the state of Florida spent about, what is it, $23 million for about 38,000 square miles. So roughly about $600 per square mile to collect. There's another one here, another statistic, which is about $200 per square mile. But they actually, the point is that they fly these drones or aircraft and they collect the LIDAR data for other reasons, usually for the purposes of what creating what are called digital elevation models. Um, but the ancillary use is what I'm actually going to talk about, right? So the folks, um, so the, the folks at Caesar and other teams have figured out have they, they're using this data that has been collected for other purposes for the purposes of forest management. Um, like I said, they are they're leveraging this data that has been already collected uh, and get additional learnings about this. And one of the things that they're using is to to calculate structural characteristics of forests, things as like forest height and canopy cover, which when you get that, it, it's a strong correlation to things about a forest, about you know the amount of timber, the biomass, which is the amount of organic material that's there, the habitat quality. So they can use these measurements and also layer it with other data. I'm not gonna talk about it, but you can also layer this with satellite data and these other things, but ultimately it's about, it's about understanding the metrics, about making decisions, and what they're doing with this, which is really cool, right? Is they're building, you know, they're building hydrology hydrology models, they're building forest inventory, so they're trying to understand, you know, the evolution of forests over time. Uh, they're they're trying to make strategic decisions, especially as it relates to uh, event response, natural event response. So using the data in pre and post hurricane image uh, forest analysis, for example, uh, identify areas in the forest for uh, maintenance and restoration and or preservation. So there's just, a, there's a lot of different things that you can do with the product of these, um, of these data sets. And ultimately what happens, right, when you take these data sets uh, and you leverage open source technologies and tools like R, for example, uh, machine learning and the cloud, it gives you better accuracy for a uh, much less cost than, uh, than doing this manually, you know, in history, before these LIDAR data, people had to go out into the field and collect this data manually. So you can imagine you can't really scale a person to cover a broad area, you know, whereas in flights, you can cover a pretty broad area in a short amount of time. So there, of course, there are trade-offs, but ultimately the long-term idea is to really leverage this data, fully integrate this into many processes and share this data across agencies, uh, et cetera, to really build a, a full-blown end-to-end uh, -end process. So this is how you don't collect LiDAR data. One second. I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> so this was last year, and I think it was October. I was down at the Apalachicola National Forest. So the folks that sees are at FAMU, they're based out of Tallahassee. Uh, and we went out into the field. They were doing some testing of these fixed wing, wing drones, uh, testing multiple vendors. This one, I believe, is SenseFly. Um, it's a fixed wing drone. That one actually did not have a LiDAR sensor in it, but I just thought it was fun to show anyway. Uh, but they actually do. There is a LiDAR sensor. It's not as sophisticated. Uh, the images I'm going to show you come from different devices. But uh, nonetheless, I wanted to show you that. Okay. So I told you I was going to show you some cool pictures. All right, so when you, we're gonna look at some, what are called point cloud uh, files. So this is what a point cloud looks like. So this is um, this is an image that's coming from the Gator Eye system. And the Gator Eye system is a really high definition, high density LIDAR system. It gives you about 5,000 points per square meter, which is pretty dense. Uh, whereas other systems can give you anywhere from four to eight meter uh, points per square meter. I mean, it, it varies, but this one is really ultra, ultra high definition, of course. The higher the definition, the bigger the file. Um, you know, the higher the definition, the shorter the or the smaller the area you can cover uh, on, a, on a given point for the detail. So there's different levels, right, of lidar. There's sort of like lower lower resolution, bigger area, higher resolution, lower area, sort of everywhere in between. So this is an example. Um, I believe that this is part of the apple. This is Western Apalachicola. Uh, and these images were taken right after Hurricane um, Michael in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to, you can't really see it here. These are just a couple of different examples. So this is actually what happens, right? You see all these different points. 
And, and that's all the data that gets collected. As the beam gets thrown down, you get a response and all this data gets processed. This is the, what's called the point cloud. And this is what is used sort of as raw data for downstream analysis for building other, other products that they're using for doing other kinds of analytics. Uh, this one, in this image in particular, you can sort of see a little bit of, of an area in, in the blue, which is the area closer to the ground that's, uh, that's less populated. That's kind of an area where trees fell. So this is uh, this was a, a, a flight path right after the Hurricane Michael, which was in the Panhandle area, um, and this flight path was near the area where the hurricane went through. So, just to give you an idea, uh, so these are a point cloud files. Um, this is a TIFF file. So what ends up happening is once you collect all this data, it you you create or there's there's multiple levels here, but you can extract a lot of this uh, a lot of layers from the point cloud and also create a little bit, uh, create TIFF files, which are used downstream. But this, these are multi-layer TIFFs. So if you open a, a multi-layer TIFF in like a typical TIFF viewer, or like uh, on your computer, whatever image viewer you have, because it's multiple layer, you can't, you're not seeing anything. So here we're actually seeing is the flight path. Um, and if I come here and I take my mouse and I kind of hover it over this, uh, I guess you can't see it. But essentially what you see here is the the whole flight path and, be, and you see a, a wide strip because that's the laser beam that's, panning left to right as the as the plane is moving. So this is sort of that circular flight. And the images that we saw that I showed you earlier were actually a part of this flight. But this is, this is looking at the entirety of the image projected onto a single plane without any color because it's just a bunch of data projected in a single plane. Well, how do these get used? Um, so they work on creating what are called raster products from these lighter uh, point clouds. And when we say raster, it basically means a grid. So uh, it's it, it raster in the sense that it's two-dimensional, but it's partitioned by grid. And those are the kinds of images that are really used downstream to produce further analysis. So I'm going to show you some of the inputs and outputs that, that are created. Um, so for example, so this is a subset of that bigger flight that I just showed you. So this is just zeroing on a really small area just for the sake of uh, illustration, but just also because also the image sizes are much smaller. Uh, and uh, I can actually show you what a bunch of these things look like. So this is this is an aerial photo. This just comes from satellite uh, from the Esri platform, which is a GIS platform. So when you overlay the 2D point, this is just the raw 2D point cloud, but it's overlaid on the on the aerial image just so you get a sense as to where things are. This is the 3D point cloud of that same area. Of course, it's not look. It's it's see it's the the point of view is not from directly from the top. It's sort of coming from the side. But ultimately, again, these are point clouds. But then we start getting into what are called the rasters. So this is where you're actually taking the from from the point cloud data. You can filter different bands and look at specific parts of this. So this is looking at the canopy um, at the canopy height, right? It's kind of like tree height or not. So a blue is more open canopy. Uh, red is denser canopy. And if we go back to the satellite, right, you see that blue right there's in this area over here or kind of towards the bottom middle there's less trees you see that it's blue because it's open um the next one sorry that's three but so that's canopy height this is canopy cover so this is the height of the trees this is actually the the cover of the trees and you can see that the reds are more more trees more leaves blue is less leaves and so on and so, so forth right this is one version of it um this is so this is canopy cover this is another canopy cover here. Uh, actually, this is shrubs. This is shru uh, shrub cover. Sorry, I mislabeled the slide. And blue is no or low shrub cover. Orange or red means it's dense. And then here, we're actually combining all of these, these different layers into a single image. So the green is canopy cover. The, uh, the blue is the shrub density. So shrubs meaning lower trees, right? Uh, and the red is the canopy canopy height, so sort of the really tall trees kind of where the things are. So here you actually get a multi-dimensional um, layer, like in, in, in a grid, right? This is a two-dimensional projection in a grid because every grid uh, is, this is resolution of one meter, I believe, one square meter. So there are metrics or calculations that are done per grid, per grid, grid cell to produce these images, right? But this basically essentially is a heat map for a lack of a better term. Um, this is, a sweep, right? This is kind of a, 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 a sliced view of, of, the, of the longitudinal or lateral sweep. So it's the same image. We're just looking at it from here. So you can see that you can do, um, again, I'm not a, an ecologist or an arborist or, or something like that, but they're, they're actually doing a lot of uh, and gleaning a lot of information, actionable information from these images. 
They're using the LIDAR package for that. Uh, so I'm just gonna show you a couple of functions, basically what you do with the LIDAR. So LIDAR is a package, uh, it's, it's, it's in active development. Uh, it seems to be the best tool out there for doing this kind of stuff in R particularly, but also um, they tried a bunch of different workflows and it seemed that this was the best. So you load the library, the library does use raster, it uses SP, uh, you need GDAL as well for certain things, not for what I'm showing you here today, but the last file can be either part of a catalog or it can be a single file. So you can read in the catalog, which is just really in the metadata. Remember, each of these files is really big. So um, that the big file, the Gatorai file, that's about the, the one I show you, that was about eight gigabytes. Um, the other one, the subset was less than about 500 megs. These are pretty large files. So when you can do a catalog and a catalog is basically a grid of images or a single image. Um, but again, so here we're reading in a single image you can see that that image covers about 4.0 uh, square kilometers. There's 274 million data points in that particular last file. Uh, but then we can subset that. You can clip it, give it coordinates and clip it and subset it. And here we're looking at a, a smaller file, which is about uh, 36,000 uh, 36, square meters, much less 7 million data points as opposed to 100 and something, something. So you can plot this directly with methods in R and get some of the images that I showed you, and then you can post-process this. But ultimately, um, what they've done is they've created a set of standard metrics, or not, I'm sorry, custom metrics that uh, basically reads in the file and produces all these sorts of metrics per layer, uh, produces a list output, and that's what they use to produce the downstream analysis. So I need to wrap up, I know. So we, um, we actually migrated this workflow from local workstations that were using data and hard drives, uh, you know, eight core machines with not a lot of memory into the cloud. So using larger scale machines with more CPUs, more memory, the data is already in the cloud, so the speeds. So we've really accelerated the the, the process for being able to process, uh, you know, many, many terabytes of data uh, in the cloud. And that's one of the things that I've actually been working on with, um, with the team. So, you know, just to kind of wrap up, this really has a, a really huge impact because they're working on the scalable, repeatable methodology that can be applied again uh, over many national forests used by other government agencies and also uh, build a workflow that folks that don't have maybe the skills or the computing resources are going to be able to use and replicate. Uh, like I said, this is the best workflow that they've been able to find in terms of um, of trying a bunch of different things. And the raster images, those 2D images are actually used as inputs for machine learning models. That can be a whole talk on its own. Uh, and like I said, it really uh, reduces the time to assess natural disaster impact. Thank you. Uh, this talk was actually made with Sharingan. I've been using Sharingan a lot for the last year in building slides for class. I, you know, as you know, I teach at Georgetown. I forgot to mention that. Uh, I really like Sharingan. This, is, uh, this was built in Sharingan and Argmarkdown. So thanks a lot, guys. Mark mentioned that we were twinning because we're both wearing you know, DCR shirts, the blue DCR shirts, but you notice he was wearing a hoodie. It was the NYR hoodie. So we were twinning in more than one way. And Mark was supposed to introduce me, but he didn't show up, so he didn't get his chance. And he said for his fun fact that I should just take a jab at him, so of course I had to be nice. But Mark's an awesome guy. We love each other. He's doing really great stuff for the community. So our next speaker is 